the question that I'm going to be dealing with is probably one of the simplest that we have uh, in many ways, and yet it's one of the most convoluted. I'm going to spend part of the time talking about, yes, a baptism is necessary to salvation. And if you want to go to heaven and you're older than a child, you need to be baptized. And you need to be baptized immersed in water. And you need to be baptized for the right reason. And I'm going to be talking about those kinds of things. You know, when I was uh, much younger, a student at Oklahoma Christian, Raymond Kelsey made the statement so many times. He said, you know, there's one thing that I know for sure. He says, I know for sure that baptism is for the remission of sins. I remember him saying that many, many times. And he said it with great emphasis and great belief. There's no way that anyone could have gone to school to Brother Raymond Kelsey or Hugo McCord or to Bill Jones or to James Baird or half a dozen of others and not have come away with that understanding of the necessity of baptism to our salvation and how important it was for us to obey the Lord in those matters and how God has been so good to us. Today I want to talk a lot about baptism and its place in God's understanding But I want us to understand that there are a lot of strange voices, and the voices that I'm going to be talking about are not among people outside the church. I want to talk about some voices that are speaking up inside the body of Christ. I preached uh, for a long time in the Nashville area. Since I moved back to Oklahoma a couple of years ago, there was a preacher who preached not more than 10 miles from where I lived, not more than 5 miles from where I lived. Who said this on a Sunday morning, and I'll be quoting a little bit of his sermon so that you'll understand. It's about baptism. And he is representative of what some of the churches of Christ are now saying. He said, We accept all believers in Christ, no matter what their religious heritage And we welcome those seeking to know Christ for the first time. Our role as God's people is not to judge others and to be divisive, but to serve as a community of healing and unity. We have chosen to emphasize what we have in common with other Christian groups rather than debate our differences. We are trying to be Christians only and believe that no particular group is designated as the only Christians. And so, as a result, we welcome and encourage all believers to join us on our journey with God. Believers immersed in other traditions because of their faith in Christ Jesus are therefore welcome to join us and be part of our family. If a person, that is one who denies the necessity of baptism for salvation but is baptized after they believe they are saved, comes into this congregation, he says, and an elder confirmed it, and they want to join this journey here, and they want to become part of this family, then he says, we will accept them as brothers and sisters in Christ. We are committed, he said, to teaching the immersion of believers, and encourage those baptized as infants to study with us, But our understanding of this practice, as it is found in the New Testament, and it's that way, he says, however, if they choose not to be immersed, we welcome them on the journey as part of this family. We, however, ask them to respect our teaching position and not be divisive. Basically, what they are saying is, really, you don't have to be immersed to be part of the family. We're going to accept you anyway. And it doesn't matter whether you understand what baptism is all about or not. We're going to accept you anyway. And the foundation for their thinking, and he goes into this in great detail, is because we want to be uh, loving towards everybody, because we want to have a friendship with people. And so their whole attitude is one of openness and unity. But their attitude is not one of... Let's listen to what Jesus Christ has to say. I don't hear that in his sermon.
what I hear is we want to listen to Jesus about unity, but getting along with others in unity becomes more important than doing the truth. I have appreciated so much of what I have heard about unity in the last uh, 24 hours. And I appreciate the need for us to come together and to be one in Christ. I appreciated that so much. And I, like many of you, am so weary, so weary of the needless fussing. And I'm so weary of the needless finger pointing. And I am so weary of the ugly divisions that have taken place in our brotherhood. Much of which started more out of personalities than it did out of doctrine. But there are some things about which there is no area for division. And a part of our understanding what it means to call Jesus Lord means that He is the final determiner. Is that a word? Yeah. He is the one who makes the final determination as to what is right and what is good. And who is and who is not a brother and sister in the Lord? Not long ago, there was another book written talking about who is our brother. And in this, there is quite a lengthy statement made about how that a person needs to be immersed to be a brother, how a person needs to be baptized for the right reason to be a brother. And how only baptized people upon the remission of, uh, excuse me, upon their repentance and confession could be brothers. And I would agree with that. But as the book goes further, he begins to take it back. Now, when I've defined what a postmodernist is, this is a postmodernist. A postmodernist is somebody who will tell you what he believes, but if it becomes inconvenient or it becomes offensive to anybody, that person will take it back. And if he takes it back, he really doesn't believe it. He does not have the conviction of his faith. And in this book, he takes it back. He says, well, and he begins to think, and everyone loves him for his thinking. But he begins to say, well, what if, what if God changes his mind later on? Or his grace is so great and so wonderful that many people will want to be close to him or be next to him. And uh, how he will just kind of dismiss some of those things. And so there are those who take the view that maybe God will send the Calvary at the last minute. And whether people have obeyed the gospel according to the teaching of Scripture or not, that God's going to save them anyway. But that is poor thinking. In the book of Galatians chapter 3, there the Apostle Paul describes how God made a promise, a covenant promise to Abraham. And how that 400 years later, the law came along. And one of the things that he made the point of is that the law coming 400 years later did not nullify the covenant promise that God made. When God enters into a covenant promise with mankind, that covenant is a firm covenant. And the best that I can understand is that when Jesus shed his blood on the cross and that blood ratified the covenant which we remember every first day of the week, that that is an eternal covenant according to the book of Hebrews. And it is a covenant between God and man. And that even if it were a human covenant, nobody could nullify it once it has been ratified. And if God has ratified His covenant, there is no one who will change, not even God will change His covenant. And it is a a terrible thing to begin to think about the nature of God. Yes, of His love on one side, but also of His holiness and of His truth on the other side. If God arbitrarily later on changes His covenant in one area, what's to say that He won't change His covenant in many other areas? If we cannot believe that God will keep His Word in all things, how can we believe that God will keep His Word in anything? God's covenant is for all time. And the faith was delivered once. For all, Jude 3. 
Jesus promised that in the first century that the Holy Spirit would guide the apostles into all the truth. And so there's not going to be some wonderful new revelation later on that we never thought about that guides what is and what is not acceptable to the Lord God or that will change His covenant. We have to be very careful whenever we think about that. And baptism is that time in which we enter the covenant with God. In the book of Hebrews chapter 8, As we read through that, we talk about this new covenant that was to be made with the house of Israel. And how they shall all know me from the least to the greatest. And how I will be merciful to their their iniquities and their, their sins will I remember no more. That forgiveness that we have under the new covenant came to us through a relationship that we have through the blood of Jesus Christ. And there's only one way I know to get in contact with the blood of Jesus Christ, and that is through baptism. According to Romans chapter 6 and verse 3, I do not know of any other way. Now, when I speak of baptism, I do not mean a baptism that is apart from faith. That's why I don't believe in sprinkling infants or even immersing infants. They don't believe. They can't believe. Not only that, there's nothing wrong with them. They don't need baptism to begin with. When I think about God's relationship with us and baptism, there is that relationship that comes out of the promise of God and the covenant of God, of His great love towards us, and of our commitment to keep His promises and to do His will. Now, I want to go a little bit further and talk about passages, many of them that you know very well. Jesus the Lord said, Go ye into all the world and preach the gospel to every creature. He that believeth and is baptized shall be saved, and he that believeth not shall be condemned. That's what the Lord said. Faith and baptism are prior to salvation. We need to know that. But I think the most telling passage is in John chapter 3. You remember Nicodemus came to Jesus by night. We don't know why. Don't really know, need to know why. Nicodemus was a ruler of the Jews. He knew an awful lot about baptism because there was a lot of baptizing of proselytes in those days. And uh, one who was baptized as a proselyte was thought of as being born again even before the time of Jesus. It was, these were not phrases they were unfamiliar with. Every ancient writer who ever talked about the new birth, a birth of water and spirit, referred to it as baptism. And so when Jesus uses this language, there's some confusion at first, but Jesus makes it very clear what he's talking about. He says to him, you must be born again. Well, how can I be born again? I'm old. How can, do I go back to my mother's womb? And he said to him, truly, I want you to look at the categorical statement. Truly, truly. King James, verily, verily. Greek, amen, amen. I say to you that unless, unless, unless this happens, that one is born of water and the Spirit, he cannot, that is, he is not able to enter the kingdom of God. Every ancient author in all the second and third century that ever referred to this verse referred to it as baptism. They understood it. They knew it was a part of it. Now, my Lord Jesus said that unless you're baptized, that is born of water and the Spirit, you cannot enter the kingdom of God. That ought to settle the matter. That's what my Lord said. And he said it in some of the most categorical terms possible. He amened himself twice before he ever said what he had to say. He used words like unless and words like cannot. He's very firm in his statement about these matters. You can't enter unless you're born of water and the Spirit. That's what the Lord said. Later on, he says, don't be marveling that I said to you that you must be born again. Something that is a must is a moral necessity. It was a moral necessity for them to be born of water and the Spirit. So, if one asks, is it necessary... To be baptized, yes, because that's what the Lord said. Now I'd like for us to turn to the book of Acts for a little while. In the book of Acts, on the day of Pentecost, whenever 
Peter and the others were preaching the gospel. And of course, there was a large number of people who came there. And Peter preached and he made it very clear that they were responsible for the death of Jesus. In fact, he makes this point twice. That with godless hands, verse 23, uh, that he was put to death. And then he makes the point as he points almost straightforwardly to them. Verse 36, Therefore let all the house of Israel know for certain that God has made him both Lord and Christ, this Jesus whom you crucified. He made it very clear to them they were responsible for his death. And they understood that because in verse 37, they were pierced to the heart and they asked, what are we going to do about it? That's the question. They were guilty of sin. They were asking, what are we going to do about it? And Peter's answer was, repent ye and let each one of you be baptized in the name of Jesus Christ for the forgiveness of your sins. And then he makes it clear, for the promises to you and to your children, to all them that are far off, even as many as the Lord our God shall call himself. The Bible says that with many other words, he solemnly testified and exhorted them, saying, saying, save yourselves or be saved from this crooked generation. And then verse 41, then they that gladly received his word were baptized, and there were added unto them in that day about 3,000 souls. But now as you look at all of this, all of it seems to fit together. We've got a problem. We're guilty of the death of Jesus. What are we going to do about it? Repent and be baptized. And you do that in the name of Jesus. And you do it for the forgiveness of sins. Now there's always this big deal made about what does that word ice mean? Is it for with the idea of looking toward? Or does it look back? And I'll guarantee you, you can buy almost any study Bible in the United States. Almost any of them. And you turn to Acts 2.38, and it will explain to you, either in kind terms, or in very straightforward, almost ugly terms, no, that verse does not mean that. It does not mean that you're baptized so that your sins will be forgiven. It means that you'll be baptized because your sins have already been forgiven. And so the question comes out, what does that word for mean? And I think it's worthwhile for us to answer that question. In 1990, I received a copy of the New Evangelical Translation. The same translation as what we commonly call the God's Word Translation, which came out in 1995 with the Old Testament. And in that version, it says in Acts 2.38, Peter answered them, Repent and be baptized, every one of you, in the name of Jesus Christ, so that your sins will be forgiven, and you will receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. Well, he makes it pretty clear. All of you who have ever read Hugo McCord's translation realizes that he says pretty much the same thing. He says, Change your hearts. And let each one of you be immersed in the name of Jesus Christ so that your sins might be forgiven and you shall receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. In 1995, the contemporary English version came out and it says, Turn back to God, be baptized in the name of Jesus Christ so that your sins will be forgiven. The New International Version, when it came out in 1974, said, Repent and be baptized, every one of you, in the name of Jesus Christ, so that your sins may be forgiven. The New Revised Standard that came out in 1989 said, Repent and be baptized, every one of you, in the name of Jesus Christ, so that your sins, so that your sins may be forgiven. More recently, in 2001, the International English Bible came out and says, Change your hearts, and each one of you must be immersed by the authority of Jesus Christ, the Messiah, so that your sins may be forgiven. Then you receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. If one looks into the J.B. Phillips translation, today's English version, the Amplified New Testament, the Good Speed version, the Easy to Read version, William Barclay's Daily Study Bible, or even the Message, he'll find out the same things. It is interesting to me, when I was growing up, everybody in the church was together on ice, meaning so that your sins would be forgiven. That is, you're baptized into forgiveness in the name of Jesus Christ. But in more recent years, all of our, uh, a lot of our brethren have thrown up their hands and say, Oh, no, that's not the way it is. Uh, that we may be all mistaken on that. 
But here are this bunch of new versions that have come out and all have agreed with what we've always taught. We won the debate and many of our brethren didn't know it. And then I think a little bit more about those, um, those um, things that have to do with the lexicons. The lexicons. Most of you were familiar with theirs that on page 40, 94 it said that it was, ice was meant to obtain the forgiveness of sins. Bauer's third, third uh, edition, the one that came out in the year 2000 in that ugly pink cover, makes it very clear that ice means to denote purpose in order to, and they translate it so that sins might be forgiven. Or you might remember the Theological Dictionary of the New Testament. Volume 2, page 429, also volume 1, makes the point that Acts 2.38 is final. The preposition denotes the direction of an action to a specific end. That is, their goal was the forgiveness of sins. That's why you're baptized. Newman and Nida, in a translator's handbook of the Acts, of the book of Acts, makes the point so that your sins will be forgiven, literally, into the forgiveness of your sins. The Expositor's Greek New Testament uh, in Acts was written by R.J. Noling, edited by a man named Nickel. Makes it very clear that he believes the same thing, that if truly penitent, people would receive upon their baptism the forgiveness of their sins. But he does an interesting thing. Now, the phrase for the forgiveness of sins appears four times in the New Testament. It first appears in Mark chapter 1, verse 4. Then it appears again in Luke 3 and verse 3. And these are occasions where John the Baptist is talking about their need uh, to be baptized and how that he baptized with a baptism of repentance for the forgiveness of sins. Then later on in the book of Matthew chapter 26 and verse 28, whenever Jesus is instituting the Lord's Supper, he makes the point about how that the blood of Jesus was shed for many for the remission of sins. Now, I want you to understand that Jesus' statement about His blood being shed so that people could be forgiven is what everybody understands. For the remission of sins. Let's go a little further down the road, down the road. That was at Passover. It was 50 days later that was Pentecost. Don't you think Peter was remembering What took place only 50 days before at such an important time and at such an important occasion? And why would he draw a phrase from that Passover experience that was the instituting of the Lord's Supper? Why would he draw that phrase for the remission of sins and use it in a way that's completely different on Pentecost than what the Lord Jesus used it whenever He was instituting the Lord's Supper. If for the remission of sins meant so the person could be saved in Luke and Mark, and if it meant that in Matthew 26, it also means that in Acts 2 and verse 38. And so there are reasons to believe those things, reasons to recognize this. I love Everett Ferguson. A number of years ago in his book, Early Christian Speak, he said this about baptism. He said, quite impressive is the way that all second century authors speak of the meaning and the benefits of baptism. Among the blessings ascribed to baptism in these writers are the following. Remission of sins, salvation, illumination, eternal life, regeneration. And the gift of the Holy Spirit. And then he says the unanimity and vigor of the early 2nd century statements about baptism are presumptive of a direct relationship between baptism and forgiveness of sins from the early days of the church. And the consistency with which the 2nd century authors make the statement, which they do, would have been impossible If this had not been the common Christian understanding earlier, 
It is inconceivable that the whole Christian world reversed its understanding of the meaning of its central right of conversion within 50 years of the lifetime of the apostles. And he is certainly correct. People understood that baptism was necessary for the remission of sins in those days. There are several other arguments that I want to make, and I'm going to run out of time if I'm not careful. I want you to turn with me to the book of Acts, chapter 9. And I want to prove to you the idea that baptism is essential before one is saved. And I think this is perhaps the most clear and the most uh, powerful argument that can be made in dealing with this. There are many, but I think this one is so clear. In Acts chapter 9, Saul of Tarsus was on the road to Damascus. He goes and the light shines down upon him. Jesus addresses him. Who, why are you persecuting me? Who are you? I'm Jesus whom you're persecuting. And then he says in verse 6, what I want you to do is I want you to rise. Now he doesn't tell him what to do to be saved. He doesn't tell him what to do to be saved here. He said, what I want you to do is rise and I want you to enter into the city. And there it shall be told you what you must do. There's that word must again. He does not tell him, does not tell him what he might do if he wants to. He tells him, you go in there and there it will be told you what you must do. Well, he goes into the city and waits. He waits for three days. In verse 9, the Bible says that he was fasting, that he was three days without sight and neither ate nor drank. Didn't eat anything, didn't drink anything three days. Then verse 11 says that he was praying. I don't know about you, but I don't think this was a willy-nilly prayer. Here was a man who persecuted the church. Here's a man who drug men and women off and put them in jail. Here was a man who held the clothes of the people who stoned Stephen. Here was a man who had a guilty conscience of himself because he knew what he had been doing. And he knew how he had been treating people. And he found out he was wrong. Not just a little bit wrong. But even years later, he would call himself the chief of sinners. If he had been saved by prayer, let me tell you what, three days of praying would have done it. (coughs) But he was not saved. He was not saved. If fasting would have saved him, he didn't need to drink anything three days. He would have been saved. But he was not saved. I know he was not saved. Someone says, Phil, how do you know? (coughs) Because nobody had come and talked to him. But later on, we find out that Ananias does come and talk to him. Turn with me now to chapter 22. Ananias comes and talks to him and he says, Brother Saul, receive your sight. Some people say, well, he called him Brother Saul. He must have been a brother. No, men and brethren, what shall we do? That's how Jews talk to each other. He wasn't a brother in Christ. He was a brother in Judaism. Dad, would you bring me that water? (coughs) They were so good to me. Oh, I had some up here. Well, this is open. You're a good man. But here was a man who came to him and he healed him. Saul was able to see. And as you look at this, one of the things that becomes so clear <clears throat> is that he's able to see a sight. And for the first time, Ananias is beginning to open his eyes about what he is to do. The God of our fathers, verse 14, has appointed you to know his will, to see the righteous one, to hear an utterance from his mouth. For you will be a witness for him to all men of what you've seen and heard. Now I want you to look at this. And now why do you delay? But arise and be baptized and wash away your sins, calling on the name of the Lord. He told him to arise and be baptized to wash away his sins. What do you mean wash away his sins? If he had been saved before he was baptized, he wouldn't have any sins to wash away. Now, I don't know about you... But at the Sanders house, when Jackie and I do laundry, and she does more than I do, we wash our dirty clothes 
We don't wash the clean ones. Saul was not dirty. Whoops, he was dirty. He was not clean. If he had been clean, he wouldn't need to be washed. Now that's how I know that his occurrence with Jesus on the road, that's not what saved him. He still needed washing. His praying for three days and fasting didn't clean him. He still needed washing. And it wasn't until he was baptized that God washed him from his sins. Now I want to change our thinking for a little bit because I think there's so many things I want to say. And that is I want us to think about what happens in baptism. The command is be baptized. Acts 2.38. Acts 22.16. Be baptized. That is a command. That is a passive imperative, not an active imperative. And there's a difference. When you have an active imperative, that means there is something that I have been commanded to do. When there is a passive imperative, then that means there is something that I am to, I am commanded to allow to happen to me. He's not commanding a person to be baptized. He's commanding him to be baptized. You let somebody immerse you. And so we have to ask the question, who is the active one in baptism? Is it the person who is baptizing or is it the person being baptized? In the physical sense, when two people go down into the baptistry, the baptizer is acting upon the baptizee. Is that a word? In the spiritual sense, God is the active one, and we are the passive one. If I say to you, believe on the Lord Jesus Christ, that's something that you do. If I say to you, repent of your sins, that's something that you do. If I say to you, confess the name of the Lord Jesus, that He is the Christ, the Son of the living God, that's something that you do. But if I say to you, be baptized, that's something where you put yourselves in the hand of God. And God acts upon you. And when someone says, you don't have to be baptized to be saved, they're interfering with the work of God. Is it not God that washes away your sins? Is it not God that causes that old man of sin to die? Is it not God that buries you with Christ? Is it not God that raises you up with Jesus? Is it not God that causes you to be born again? Is it not God who begets you as His child? Is it not God that adds you to His church? Is it not God that gives you the gift of the Holy Spirit? whereby you are sealed for the day of redemption? Who is the active one in baptism? It's not you. You haven't done anything. You've let God work on you. And when the devil gives the idea that baptism isn't necessary to salvation, what they're doing is not interfering with you. They're interfering with God at the cost of your soul. And let me tell you something. When someone says you're saved before you're baptized so that you think baptism's not necessary, or someone says, let's change baptism and make it into our own image, and if we want to sprinkle somebody, that's okay. They're interfering with God and what God is doing. And that's what makes it wrong. That's what makes it wrong. I don't buy this idea that baptism is a work that we do To merit salvation. Now it's necessary and you can't be saved without it. But you don't earn anything by it. What you do is by faith and humility and love. Put yourself in the hand of God. And let God work on your soul. To clean you up. And to do things that you could not do by yourself. And when someone says to me, oh, we can do it any way we want to, 
It's not legalism that makes me object to it. It's saying, let's let God work in our lives. God is the active one. We are the passive ones. In the time that we have remaining, I want to talk about it from a practical standpoint. Is baptism necessary? I tell you what, if you were to sit and listen in some of our pulpits, I thought Bruce's question last night, how long would it be if somebody came into our services and heard the gospel? Would they know the need to be obedient or know how to be obedient was a tremendous question. I'm finding that preachers across the country are no longer offering very good invitations. And some of them don't know how. I understand that maybe not every service needs a long, lengthy invitation. I know we can't make every service into a gospel meeting. But I'm convinced that we've sometimes gone to the other direction and we think that our services are so much for edification. That if a non-believer ever came to our services, they'd be there a very long time before they ever heard a real good comprehensive statement of what to do to be saved. And the importance of it. And the urgency of it. You think with me just a little bit. Then they that gladly received His word were baptized, and there were added unto them in that day 3,000 souls. They didn't wait another day. They didn't put it off for another week. They wanted to do it right then. And as you read through those first few chapters of Acts, they were being baptized every day. As soon as they learned they were going to do it, there was a great sense of urgency. In Acts chapter 8 and verse 12, when they heard about Jesus in Samaria, Philip preaching, they were being baptized, both men and women alike. And whenever Philip taught the eunuch, They came to some water. We don't know what all he did when he was preaching Jesus to him, verse 35. But one thing we know is that the very next verse he saw water and he wanted to be baptized. Let me tell you what, preaching Jesus is preaching baptism. And you haven't finished preaching Jesus if you don't preach baptism. Behold, here's water. What's stopping me from being baptized? There was a sense of urgency He baptized him. They went on their way rejoicing. I think about Acts 9, and when Ananias finally did get around to coming to see Saul, he was a scaredy cat. What are you waiting for? Acts chapter 10, Peter, verse 48, ordered them, commanded them to be baptized. Go a little further. The same hour of the night. It was midnight when the earthquake took place. Saul taught them. Paul did. And they were baptized the same hour of the night. Brethren, we don't have any sense of urgency. We don't have much sense of urgency. And this sense of urgency, as you read through the book of Acts, is one of the reasons why I believe that baptism is so necessary for salvation. Because this urgency says, we can't wait. We can't put it off. This is something that's so important that we might lose our souls if we don't do it now. And I don't see sometimes that great sense of urgency. I talked about our invitations. If I'm offering an invitation and I say, if you need baptism, then you come forward. I'm assuming that people know that they're lost in sin. I'm assuming that people know their need for not only baptism and when have you heard repentance along with it. Let me tell you what, you baptize somebody who hasn't repented, they're not saved. Any more than if they repented and, uh, but weren't baptized. Or they were baptized and didn't believe. I don't believe in in just baptizing people. 
I want them first to believe and to repent and turn away from sin. If you need baptism, man, there's a whole lot of things they need before they need baptism. Baptism is the culmination of our faith and the transformation of our lives. It's the time when the blood cleanses us, yes. But it's on our faith and our repentance that's a part of that too. And when we believe with all of our hearts that Jesus is the Christ, and we're willing to turn away from sin, and we're willing to embrace the Lord in a positive way, and whatever He says we're going to do, wherever He sends us, we're going to go. And we're willing to confess Him before everybody else. Confession is a public thing, by the way. Then we're ready to be baptized. And it's then that God acts upon us as we put ourselves into His hands. When you offer an invitation, offer it complete enough where people know that they're lost and that they need the Lord. Two evangelical preachers were sitting in a TV show and they were talking and One of them was saying, I am so glad that you're not always preaching on sin. He says this to the other one. The other one says, that's right. Whenever a person is drowning, you don't describe the water. You throw him a rope and everybody claps. Oh, our problem is, our problem is, and Ralph explained it so well earlier, our people don't know they're lost. They don't know what sin is. They don't know what holiness is. They don't know that God means what He says in His Word. They don't know what the Word says. And brethren, the idea that somehow we can come to our churches and preach to our people and have young people come in and young people go out and we lose so many of them because they don't know they're lost. And they've never seen the love of Jesus. They don't know that hell is real. Oh, brethren, is it too much to ask us with a broken heart to plead with people to come to the Lord before it's everlastingly too late? I I am just amazed that within such a short time, We have forgotten the need for an invitation. And brethren, it is not just the invitation. It is everything that goes with it that is needed so badly. Let me tell you what. You can't look at the cross and not want to plead with people about the love of Jesus. You can't look at the cross... And not see the terrible nature of the sin. And you can't look at the cross and say there's got to be some way that the blood that was shed could be applied to my soul. It is applied to your soul and it begins, doesn't end, but it begins at that once baptism that takes place. And if we don't explain that to people, how the love and the blood of Jesus can make a difference in the life of somebody... We are utter failures. And everything else is a bunch of triviality. Okay, that's enough. If we ask the question, is baptism necessary to sin, when was it not ever necessary? If it was ever necessary, it's necessary now.